I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. The one thing I always have with me is my phone, so I've learned to adapt to that. I've actually started using my phone as a sketchbook. And that's made things a lot easier, because I always forget my sketchbook. So I'm wondering if maybe I should start recording my thoughts on my phone, because sometimes when I go to record the podcast, I'll forget what I want to say about it. Using my phone just to kind of create my first best thought might make it a little more cohesive. I don't know. Or it might sound like garbage. Let's see, though. So I think this season I'm going to try to involve more of my inner thoughts at the time that I have them by using my phone. I wanted to try and remember what I had said at the pop-up that I did this weekend. So basically, people were coming up to my booth, and I have comics laid out and some stickers, so I had to kind of explain it to them over and over again as people walked up. Now, first they would walk up to the display that I had a couple of prints of some of the panels, starting from the very first one to a couple of the more recent ones that were a little more lighthearted. So they'd walk up and look at it, and I'd kind of see that they were wondering. And... I'd start by saying, this right here is a daily comic blog that I do. So every day I draw something, and it all started back in May 2017 with this first panel right here. I wanted to do comics again, and the day that I went to meet my wife to tell her about it, she had told me that she was diagnosed with breast cancer. They look at me surprised, and I go, don't worry, she's doing well, she's all better and in full recovery she's standing right here and then she waves hi and I go and but from that moment things changed so I also and then I show them the cover and I go this right here is actually when we went to the doctor's office and the doctor explained to us that she was going to have a lumpectomy the picture of course of the cover is Mary Joy shouting fuck in the car and then I explained to them she tells me she doesn't even remember doing this but of course I remember it very well So I kept doing this to help us get through it. And I drew it every day, and it kind of created a dialogue between us. So I would express my feelings or just document something that happened. They weren't all bad. Sometimes it was just things that went on that day to kind of remember what we were going through. And as she got better, they became just about life in general because I always think to myself, if someone asked me, did anything happen today? And it's real easy just to say, no, nothing happened. I didn't do anything today. Well, something always happens. And that's what this is all about. So like this panel right here, and then I point to the one of the kids eating pizza in their front yard. I go, this really happened. I was at a stoplight waiting for it to change. And I look over and there are these kids eating at a table in their front yard. And one of them looks at me. And he holds up the pizza that he's eating and he just shouts, I love pizza. And I thought that was fantastic. I mean, who can argue with that? So I made a comic about that. So I was doing this and just kind of, I was making comics again. And then that led up to me putting this all into the book that I'm selling here today. And the reason I'm selling the book is because my wife and I wanted to do something different with our lives. So as I was making this comic, I wanted to meet other artists. So I started a podcast. And in that podcast, I was meeting people, and one of the people I met was Tammy, who did pop-up events. And she basically said, I should try and do one. And I went, okay. And that led to me doing this here just a little over a year later after meeting her. And now I'm selling things and talking to you about it. And that's how this whole show, this podcast began, is I wanted to meet other artists and talk to them about what they do. And that was kind of the pitch that I created. I liked the way that it moved, I guess. I almost feel like I said more trying to explain it because I'm overthinking it now. But at the time of doing it and trying to keep people's attention, I feel like it went a lot shorter. But maybe it was that long. I don't know. I got to write that down and maybe clean it up. Maybe take out some stuff. Maybe I oversaid. I don't know. I'd be curious to hear this back. The person I got to meet today is because I responded to a message that they sent out on their email list. 
one of the emails that she sent out was about the fact that she had a new book coming out and she was asking the people on her email list where should she go to talk. So, of course, just getting back from talking to Ivan Brunetti in Chicago, I said, would you like to talk on my show? Just like before, I didn't know if I was going to hear back, but it was it was one of those things where if I hesitated and didn't do it, I'd always go, could I have done it? So I did. And to my absolute surprise, she messaged me back and said that she would come on the show and talk with me. So the person I got to talk to today is Jessica Abel. She's a comic book artist. She's done a lot of books over the years. She actually just released a series that she's been doing called Trish Trash, which is about a roller girl who lives on Mars. But she's also done things like a book about creative focus called Growing Gills. And if you've ever been into public radio and researched how they make the shows that they do, she was the illustrator for Radio and Illustrated Guide, which is a collaboration she did with Ira Glass. Like I said, I didn't think that I was going to hear back from her, but she was nice enough to talk to me and I was nervous as I'll get out. But here is my interview with Jessica Abel. How did you start out drawing? Like when was the first time that you decided you wanted to be a cartoonist? I started, I mean, I drew all my life like most kids do and just kind of didn't stop. I was interested in comics and really liked comics as a kid, but I didn't imagine myself doing them. I'm not one of those kids who's got like a whole bunch of full issues of something or other when I was 12 or whatever stashed away. You know, I didn't do that. Started drawing comics-y sort of things maybe as a senior in high school. Not really full comics, but kind of. And then I started drawing a little bit more seriously when I got to college. My first stories were actually drawn for class assignments. I mean, they were like, I asked permission to do them instead of papers. Oh, really? Yeah. You've just kind of done that for a long period of time. Essentially, at the time when I was in college, I was thinking like, oh, this is going to be more fun than writing a paper. Frankly, I think that my textual analysis was weak (laughs) when it came to my comics that I was turning in, but I still got good grades on them because the teachers were like, that's a lot of effort. Great. And I did just, I did that a couple of times and it worked out fine for me in terms of grades, but I'm not sure it was much as far as a paper goes. Okay. So to compare that to what I did when I did Out on the Wire, it's a whole other, that's a, just a whole other ball of wax, like a whole other story. But then you did a book recently that was actually based on one of your courses, oh, Growing, Growing Gills. Up. Yes. Yeah. And that one is, that one's flat out book. When you say flat out book, you mean it's prose. Yes. Yes. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I know that's so coming from a guy behind me, I have tons of comics. So coming from a guy who likes to look at all the pictures while he's reading. Yeah. I'll say, I like to refer to those as actual books. The, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and when I saw that, I'm like, Oh, it's, I can't write like, or at least I don't think I can. So what made you decide to do that one in more prose rather than drawing it graphically? I would never attempt to do that book in in graphic form and graphic narrative. I mean, doing Out on the Wire in graphic narrative was, I think, a really good choice for the material because there's there's a lot of a lot I can do with visual metaphor to convey concepts of how do you build narrative. So I mean, to go back a little bit. For your listeners, Out on the Wire is a book about the narrative techniques of some of the best podcasters and radio producers in the world, you know, including producers from uh, This American Life and Planet Money and Snap Judgment and Radio Lab and, you know, all these big shows. And I did interviews with all of those people and tried to figure out what is it that makes magic for them? How does that work? And those are very abstract principles. And so I had to work very hard to create visual metaphors for those things that would make them stick. But I feel like having done that work, that is something that's very powerful for readers that they're able to understand these concepts at a much deeper level because it's sort of embodied in a sense. And the reason I did it as a reason I did it at all is because of the original comic I did, Radio and Illustrated Guide, back in 1999 with Ira Glass and This American Life, where I documented how they literally put their show together. What were the stages of work that go into making an episode? That's only a 30 page book. I mean, it's a a comic book, really. And I did that for like Pledge Drive premiums back in 99. Oh, did you really? Um, Yeah. I didn't know that. That's cool. It stayed in print for, you know, it's in print for, well, it's still in print, but I mean, it was in print for 12 years or whatever. And I kept encountering people 
who were professional radio producers, great ones, who had read the book early on and it had been formative for them. A few people actually decided to become producers because of my book. So it was this very powerful thing for me. It's not something wow. that happens very often in the life of a cartoonist. And I realized there was so much more happening and so much more to say. So I started the book in 2011, 2012, out on the wire, I mean. That was really just at the tipping point of the whole podcast revolution, evolution we're in right now. And I didn't know what was coming, but already there was so much more diversity out there and what was available in audio. So I really wanted to talk about that. And, and I had to figure out a new angle in. So instead of going tactically, like what are, you know, you record, then you cut it, then you, which is what's in Radio and Illustrated Guide, I went through the stages of building a narrative. And so, I mean, I would never have dreamed of doing such a book if Ira Glass hadn't called me in 1998 and said, do you want to draw a comic book about this American life? Like that just wasn't even my idea. It was his idea. Yeah. And how did that even come to him? He was just like, you know what we should do? We should get a comic book together for this. I mean, how does that even come up really? Well, he's a very creative person when it comes to pledge drives. I don't know if you've ever noticed, he's always coming up with cool, funny stuff to do. And um, it was just one of his wacky ideas. And he'd actually cut out a comic of mine from the new city, which was a local tabloid paper that I did comics in sometimes, uh, nonfiction comics. He cut it out like two, three years earlier. It was in his files. He pulled it out and he called me. And I was living in Mexico City at the time. It was one of the most bizarre phone calls I've ever received. Like awesome and bizarre, but yeah. bizarre. Like you don't expect to hear Ira Glass, who I listen to every week already at that time. Wait, so up until this point, you actually didn't know him? No, oh, no. Oh, I okay. Met. I was under the assumption that you did. I That part of the story I never knew. That's fascinating. No, no, no. He, he looked me up in the phone book, like literally in the white pages. Oh, wow. That is yeah. a whole new layer. I had been in Chicago, but I had moved to Mexico City six months earlier, or almost six months earlier, I'd actually put a forwarding, you could at the time put a forwarding message on your m- number right. saying like, I'm not at this number, blah, blah, blah. And so I paid to do that for six months and it was going to cut off in a couple of weeks. He called me, got my number and called me in Mexico. He's the only person who ever did, by the way, in six months, <laughs> the only person who ever got my phone number in Mexico and then actually called me in Mexico. I love that. That's back in the day when you just didn't have your phone with you all the time. Yeah, it's still in print. You can buy it from This American Life from yeah. the website. You can buy the PDF version or the paper version, as far as I know. I think they st- they're still in print. And the the core part of it, there's a few pieces that I left out because they weren't relevant to the new book, but the, about 24 pages of it is in Out on the Wire as a preface. Oh. So like you can get the whole thing in one. You know, So you get the tactical piece and then you get the you know, sort of the structural piece as well. Most of my other books have been fiction. My other comics have been fiction. I have two textbooks about making comics, so that's also part of my sort of pedagogical narrative, like building stories, the piece of what I do. But in the last uh, three and a half years or so, I've gotten into teaching how to build a sustainable creative life, basically how to create space in your life for really ambitious, huge projects that have no deadline and no boss. And you have to figure out how to do them on your own and you procrastinate and get perfectionistic and all that kind of stuff about it. How to actually make that happen. The form I teach it in is a group coaching program. And I compiled a lot of material from that course, from the first year or so of that course and blog posts I'd written and things like that into, and I rewrote them into a book called Growing Gills. It's a prose book because it doesn't need to be a graphic novel. It doesn't, it doesn't need that form it's full of exercises and stuff to do. And I mean, it just, I don't, I don't feel the need. <laughs> I don't think right. it needs to be done. And so why, why would I put myself through three years or whatever of drawing the thing? You, you decide for your creative career, you need to do more time. And on top of that, decided to do a course that you were then going to teach, which is adding another layer. Like what made you decide to well, actually do the course? I'm doing it to help other people make those things, those big projects happen. And for me, the big project right now is creating a group coaching program. And it's writing Growing Gills, and that happened already. But it's like that work right now is my creative work. That's what I'm doing right now. I just finished my big sci-fi comic, Trish Trash, Roller Girl of Mars, and that's going to come out in December. The third volume and also the collection of all three is going to come out in December. So that's the, the most recent comics I've drawn. And I don't have any on the docket. I'm not doing anything with okay. that right now. So... I mean, I've definitely learned an enormous amount about how to organize my own creative life from working with, you know, whatever, 300 creative people with organizing their lives, getting their lives oriented. It's not organizing, but getting them oriented around, you know, the thing that they 
say is the most important thing, but that doesn't happen. And so that's been something that's been clarifying for me as well. But that, I mean, I'm really enjoying doing this. I mean, it's, it's fun for me to, to teach this stuff and to work with people and do coaching. And it's really cool. I really like it. So after you discovered how to do it for yourself, that's when you decided that you wanted to create a course to share how you figured it out with other people. Uh, not exactly. It's actually, oh. it was, it came from the people. Like I was, when I did out on the wire, the podcast, the initial run of the podcast, which is a, a limited series and it has a pedagogical angle to it. So there's, there's episodes with challenges in them. So if you, at the end of each episode, it's like, now try it yourself. Here's what you should do. And when we put it out, initially we had an online group where people could post their work and get feedback from other people and from us. And Every other episode was a workshop episode where we would take work from the group and talk about it live on the show. So we had fully scripted episodes and then workshop episodes. So that group was very vibrant. It was very involved. I, I basically talked to those people. I asked, you know, I sent out a survey and I asked them, so if I was going to help you with something else other than like this actual podcast, like what's the next thing? Like what, what do you need from me? And really I was expecting to hear you know, I want help with script format or dialogue or building characters or story structure, you know, that kind of thing. But what I got was, you know, I can't get my work finished. I'm procrastinating. I don't have, you know, I'm too busy to do this, but this is my dream and all this kind of stuff. And I just realized that I had something to offer there, that something that people would want. And it really grew from something quite modest. Like initially it was just a little, it was a, a challenge. It was a, a little sort of pilot program where for a week, I sent out emails with kind of little, you know, try this, try this, try this, and got feedback from all those people and then used that, how that worked to build it into a more complete course. But it was not designed as a course with like pre-written materials. It was like emails. And so when I got feedback from them, when I got learned from how that worked, then I developed it into a course. And then the course ran for a few times. And then I've developed the course into a group coaching program with more, a more elaborate kind of superstructure to really help people get all the way through moving to a new mode, essentially. Had you done classroom teaching before? Has it been more of like course teaching or, or you know, formats like this? Oh, yeah, lots. Um, okay. I, so I went to go back to the beginning. I went to school for English. I was an English major, so learned to write. <laughs> so that was not hard. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's hard, but it's not, it was not like a jump. I mean, it's going to say, right. it's hard for me. I'm not any good at it. And teaching, I've been teaching classroom teaching for since 2000, well, since 98, really, but re like regularly on an annual basis since 2001, teaching comics, teaching, you know, building narrative, building stories, uh, various kinds of more thesis oriented classes where there's like more involvement with the students process. And I started teaching, I, I taught at SVA for 12 years, School of Visual Arts in New York. And then I was teaching online for an MFA program at CCA, the California College of Arts. That's a low residency ma master's program. So they had during the school year, like during the summer, they'd be there. But during the school year, they had online classes. And that's when I started really teaching online. And that was in 2012, 2013, somewhere around there. And then I've been building and developing my sort of online teaching methodology since then. And right now I'm here where I am right now, where I'm standing right now is my office at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, where I'm the head of the illustration de department and I teach illustration classes. Oh, okay. I practice other things like that. So yes, I am, have a long history teaching. And this is actually, I mean, I think it's a great question. I mean, you didn't know the answer to that, so you needed to ask, but also like, it's a really great question because I think a lot of people who do various kinds of online teaching don't have that kind of background. They just go and they're like, I have a thing I want to teach. And so I'm going to make a course out of it. I didn't really think about the fact that I had that background when I started building these materials. Like I didn't, but, but you know, I've written two textbooks, yeah. you know, I mean, I thought about, you know, pedagogy and like how to convey ideas and how to break things down into, you know, actionable ex activities and exercises for years. I mean, it's just, it's one of the main things I do. And so it felt very natural for me to do this. And, and because I've been trying to figure out how to teach, how to turn an online experience into something as close as possible to an, a real life seminar experience, which is not easy. You know, yeah. there's, there's a lot fighting against that. So you want to have this be something that's like 
asynchronous, available all over the planet, you know, all these things, and yet also has the intensity and the exchange of a classroom experience where you're standing next to each other. It's not the same, but it actually has some strengths that they, you know, that the uh, in life, in real life experience does not have, you know, so there's some trade-offs, but I feel like, you know, I've actually pulled together a bunch of different tools. I don't just do it in one thing. It's not like just a course platform and you just do it on your own. It's like, there's a whole bunch of different pieces to it, which is why it's like a coaching, coaching program and not just reading a book. But all of those pieces are in place in order to kind of replicate little pieces that I find super important about the live teaching experience. But it's a give and take on both ends, too, because some of the people that sign up for it aren't going to have the ability to get into a physical classroom with you. And that's and you're oh, able yeah. to reach no, out no, to no. them. I mean, they're major. It, also, we, they can do it any time of the day or night. You yeah. know, like right now I'm teaching a cohort of the Great Folks Workshop. I've got students in New Zealand, Africa, the Netherlands, several in France, UK, South America. Canada and the U S nice, <laughs> like all over the world. Right. Yeah. Oh, and Australia. So it's, you have that ability for people to come together and to find kindred spirits and to get feedback and help from people like, you know, all over the planet and, and people all over the planet have access to what I can offer. And I know that my particular combination of what I bring, you know, the things that I bring to this in my history are, you know, fairly unique. How did you come up with your style? What were some of your influences? I've worked in a bunch of different styles, and I think that the biggest influences on a style like Trish Trash that I use in Trish Trash are really sort of maybe classic French comics, not stuff that's happening now so much as from the, the 70s. And even that, it's not really, that's not really accurate either. I mean, it, I think basically I just draw it as well as I can. Okay. <laughs> and... <laughs> like do the best I can to get it, you know, to look right. And, and I, I like to simplify parts of my instinct. They, I fight myself, you know, and I want to fill things up with hatching or do, you know, do stuff that's not going to support the work. The nice thing about Trish Trash is, is it's in full color and the colorist Walter is really great. And so I was able to keep myself under control, not over, detail anything, just keep things pretty simple and, and rely on his work to, you know, fill those in. And I was working also with an assistant, Lydia Roberts, who did all the backgrounds, you know, trucks and things that I'm terrible at. She's kind of amazing. She just is, has such a facility for that. And I never would have done the book if I couldn't have hired her. <laughs> how, how did you find her to, uh, to She's get a former her... student. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, we'll see. That's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hire her when she was a student. I hired her after she graduated. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> what was and for money? I paid her money. Okay. It's oh, not... <laughs> that, that's actually a good point. You should. Yeah, it's not just a hey, want an opportunity to work with me thing. Uh, uh, you actually that would never have lasted. No, this is a, a marathon. It was a marathon. What was your? Uh, I guess I want to say what was your jam growing up that you would draw? Like mine was Garfield horses. Really? I yeah, hated I drawing. Girl. I hated drawing horses. Oh my God. The knees were the thing. I never knew which way they were supposed to bend or where they were located. See, I was a horsey kid. I, I knew all about that. Really? I'm a little jealous of that. I even had that how to draw animals book that was in our library like forever. And I just never got it. You had the circles and stuff didn't make sense. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's, I'm looking at the page and doing what they're telling me, but I'm not paying attention to where I'm putting them. So then I just did Garfield because it was just a big round face and round eyes. I do a lot of eyes too, like eyes with lots of eyelashes and eyebrows, you yeah. know? Okay. And then, and then why, uh, in question mark above it. And that, that was my teen angst thing. You would write why <laughs> above stuff. <laughs> So how do you promote yourself? Do you do advertising? Is it, uh, do you have people do it for you? I mean, how, how do you get the word out there? It depends on the project. For the Creative Focus Workshop and for that work, I do a lot of promotion. I write a blog. I send the blog out to a newsletter, keep a newsletter, invite people to the newsletter, send it out on social media and share it in that way. I go on podcasts, that promotion. I I do a lot of talking about the work and 
plan to do speaking, a lot of speaking and, and events and things like that as well. For books, it's tougher often. I mean, Growing Gills is self-published. I did that intentionally so that I would be able to just kind of make promotional decisions on my own and not have to consult anybody. So I'm starting to do some advertising for that on Amazon, within the Amazon sort of you know, ecosystem. You're doing it in the uh, KDP advertising section? Yeah, we just I just started looking at that. I don't it hasn't gone live yet, but I think, you know, today or tomorrow I'm going to put some ads up and make them go live. Well, I've been using that for a little while and I started doing it to like authors and all that kind of stuff in Amazon, unlike any other place. It's really all about the uh the exact keyword. I found the only thing like literally was pinpointing the keyword. Just just out of you said you hadn't used it yet and it was out of what the experience was, so I was just offering that up. No, no, no. That's, I think that's useful information. I mean, that's the kind of thing you need, right? Is you need to share tips and figure out what's working for other people and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, one of the reasons I'm growing guilds as a prose book is so it would work well as an ebook, which none of my books do because they're comics, which aren't great as ebooks. Yeah. So that was, you know, I wanted that to be like a primary, you know, channel for it. So prose, mm. right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so that I do. And, you know, I did a, like, with Growing Gills, when you buy Growing Gills, you can get a free workbook, but you sign up for my mailing list to get the workbook. So that gets people into my ecosystem. So there's a lot of stuff thinking about, a lot of go, thinking that goes on about that. When you're looking at some, when I'm looking at something like Trish Trash, it's tricky though, because it's not, I don't have a budget for it. You know, I don't have a time budget. I don't have a money budget. And if I were um, in a position right now where I was saying, you know, what I really want to do is double down on my comics career and make you know, make waves there, I'd be putting in all kinds of free time on sending it out to people, you know, writing emails, getting it in front of people, asking people to take a look at it, asking people to review it, get trying to get on podcasts about that. And I'll be doing a certain amount of that, you know, over the next few months. But, you know, it's just, I only have the time I have, right? Right. And I have to look at the ROI on it. Mm -hmm. So I don't do as much as I could do. But also, I don't have I don't have a budget for it, right? It's the it's the publisher's job to promote the book, and so they're the ones who should be doing paid advertising for it, and they're the ones who should be putting me in front of, you know, journalists and podcasters and whatever. They'll have a certain amount of stuff that they will do, but you know, all authors know that there's just a limit to that. And if you want your book to go any bigger, you either have to make some kind of agreement with your publisher that they're going to do it for you or you just have to do it yourself and just you know do the work without yeah. knowing that there's going to be any payoff for you the thing about books when you when you publish with a mainstream publisher and you get any kind of advance especially a reasonably nice advance is you will probably never see a penny of royalties because you probably never pay that advance back i've only ever done the self-publishing so i start out with nothing so i know that part I don't know. The, I don't know the uh, getting the money. But if you're publishing, then you know there are downsides to that, obviously. But yeah. The upside is you can see exactly what the result is of actions you're taking. True. Like the and metrics you, are, I get to see. Like they're my metrics that I get to look at. It's not somebody telling me like, well, it could be doing this or. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, on ads specifically, you can see how many clicks did you get? Are people into this? You know, True. what if I tweak this? Is this going to work? Is this going to get you know be better? You know, if you send it out to journalists and to, you know, podcasters and people and try to get interviewed, you can find out, well, I need to send out three requests before I get an interview. Or I need to send out 10 requests before I get an interview. You can make, you can figure out what the numbers are. You can decide how important it is to you, you know, and put the effort in where it makes sense. It's kind of nice to hear after you get done talking with someone who's got an actual Wikipedia page that they too are kind of thinking about the benefits of self-publishing. It gives you a sense that there is the opportunity for anyone to be able to become successful, that the new model using the internet can work for anyone. Not that it's just going to happen overnight. You have to do it all yourself. But in the end, why wouldn't you want control of your own product, of your own thing that you put out there? I find that kind of inspiring. You can learn more about Jessica at her website, jessicaable.com. And of course, her book, Trish Trash, is available now on Amazon. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to this show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music for the show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music, which you can learn more about at LorenzosMusic.com. 
If you'd like to check out my book, Then This Happened, A Diary About Breast Cancer, you can learn more about it at book.americanbandito.com. Next week, I actually hit the road to go meet someone in Minneapolis who I friended on Instagram. So until then, so long. Mm-hmm.